Well, hello and welcome to this edition of the EV Revolution Show. My name is Kenneth Bocor and thanks for tuning into episode 29 here in the frozen tundra that is Canada and most of North America with the polar vortex that we have going on. So I've got a few stories, so it'll be a shorter show today. One thing I wanted to talk about, though, is I, I put a, a video up and there's a lot of other videos that are coming out about winter driving and uh, winter aspects of owning a battery electric vehicle. Now, you've all heard about handling capabilities and all that good stuff uh, with the low center of gravity with the battery packs and, you know, some of them being all wheel drive, front wheel drive, so forth. I did a little tooting around in my Nissan Leaf a week or so ago and put that out there. And I've got some good positive comments that people thought that that was very helpful. There's a lot of other stuff, of course, a lot of Model 3s that are zooming around in the snow and other vehicles. So I encourage you to check them out. But the main thing to consider, again, with uh, especially a battery electric vehicle and then, you know, with most cars is number one, you know, for winter driving tips, get a really good set of winter tires. If you're going to be in any conditions that have some snow for any length of time, or it doesn't have to be a lot of snow. It could be ice mixtures as well. When that snow packs down, you get these cold temperatures like we're getting now here in North America and in other parts of the world. You know, that can create for some slippery uh, slippery uh, conditions and issues on the road. Some states and some areas don't have good plow systems. They don't have good salt and sanders and they're not really prepared for any snow. So when you do get it, it can kind of be pretty crippling at times. So the best pair or best set of winter tires that you can afford, in my opinion, is the way you got to go, especially if you do any driving in the wintertime. So that's number one. And from a battery electric perspective, that weight does help in the handling, uh, handling capabilities of the vehicle. But they also have things like preconditioning. You can warm up the car, uh, either what, what's plugged in or what's not plugged in. Uh, you don't have to worry about exhaust fumes. If you're going to do it inside a, an underground parking lot or a garage or something, you can just let it uh, preheat, precondition, melt a lot of the snow if you're outside and ice and all that good stuff. Stuff. So there's benefits there. You can usually remotely access those through your smartphone. Most of the electric vehicles today have apps and have connectivity to the cars um, that you can uh, uh, do remote functions like that. So take advantage of those things. That's kind of all I wanted to say about winter. Now that we're in the midst of winter here is, is you know, go out, practice. If you have a battery electric, battery electric vehicle or a plug-in hybrid vehicle, take it out on this. If you haven't done it yet, take it out in the snow, practice a little bit, find a safe place. You'll see in my last video, I talked about that. Um, just get a little practice under your belt, know how it handles. Uh, I was very, very pleasantly surprised at how the Leaf handles. And as I said in the video, I've driven a lot of front wheel drive cars and rear wheel drive in my time. I've owned, personally owned probably about 30, oh, more than 30 vehicles since I was 16 and got my first car way back when. Uh, so I've got a pretty good experience, both automatic, manual, big, small, all kinds of different cars. So. Uh, uh, take it from me, they handle really well, but you got to practice, got to learn the limits of the vehicle and the traction control and all the safety systems there. So uh, hope that helps for some winter driving tips. Now I wanted to get into some of the top stories I'm following this week. There's a great article that came out by uh, Clean Technica, and I won't, it's a very long article, there's a lot of points in it, but it was basically a highlight of what happened or what changed in the EV industry for 2018, because it really was a monumental year of, of a paradigm shift. And, you know, I've talked about the curve and all that good stuff before of the influx of electric vehicles and the market awareness now that electric vehicles are, are coming with or are, are coming around the world, coming out with. So, you know, five years ago, they were very small uh, uh, element of the auto industry and you know you see the odd EV here and there and you know people think okay that's that's cool you're, you're trying to save the planet but it's not mainstream well really EVs have hit mainstream and 2018 was a great year from a catalyst perspective in a few different areas one of them was EV charging and I won't get into all the things that happened in 2019 in 2018 from an EV charging but a few of the highlights included Companies like Audi, Amazon, Electrify America, and Arcadia Power teaming up for an EV charging collaboration. Here are companies just a few short years ago that you would never think that would that would A, be in existence, or B, that be teaming up to provide uh, EV charging collaborations. Uh, and Amazon's uh, no slouch when it comes to market. They're very, very smart people there, so it's no surprise to see that. Big oil like BP, you know, snapping up UK electric vehicle charging network Chargemaster in 2018, one of the largest providers in the UK, seeing an opportunity. And, and I reported on that, I think, on my last show or a couple of shows ago about Shell and stuff. 
big oil is now saying, hey, if I can't beat them, let's join them. Let's uh, pr provision for electric vehicle refueling or charging as well as petrol and, and, and gas while we still have it. So they're getting into the game by buying up uh, companies or, or building their own environments. ChargePoint was very active last year. They introduced something called the wait list, and it's to let EV drivers get in line digitally to charge at a charging station. So you know, with more EVs coming out, that is a problem that a lot of people are discussing, especially Tesla owners, because of the influx of Model 3s. A lot of the superchargers uh, are going to become very, very busy with all these Model 3s out there now on the roads. And, and, but uh, overall, from ChargePoint, they've got this app so that you can just basically put yourself in line saying, I'm waiting next and not have to really worry about it. The app will notify you when the, guys, uh, the, the, the guy or girl ahead of you is finished, and then you can go and charge your car. Now, ChargePoint and EV Box also partnered in the uh, both Europe and North American uh, mar marketplaces for roaming access. And that's the same as charge point and green lots in the US so that you could just use one card now and, and access more and more uh, multiple vendor charging stations. So I think that's a great idea to get into this seamless. Hopefully one day we'll get to a one card or a one app perspective where you can go to pretty well any charging station out there and tap your card or put in an ID or use an app to access that station and all the billing will be done in the back end. You don't have to worry about carrying multiple multiple cards and having multiple apps. So I think that's a great idea that ChargePoint and others started to do last year. Electrify America, who I've talked about a lot in the past, uh, they announced installation of 100 EV fast chargers at Walmarts across the country. So trying to cash into the retail game like uh, uh, IKEA has and like a lot of other retail outlets and malls that are putting in charging stations. Here they want to put some fast chargers into Walmart so that people go into shop, spend half an hour or an hour get what they need to do and then uh, their car is charged and they're probably making a few bucks out of that as well um, and that's also going to expand to uh, over a hundred other retail convenience and refueling partners as they build out so again another concept of putting evs where ev chargers where they make sense not in these isolated little areas along the road where there's nothing around there put them in places where people are going to go and spend some time anyway and this way you get to refuel and you get to spend some money and service those businesses that are in this area now, Google Maps also got into it in 2018 by updating its app to include an EV charging feature. Um, so even them, uh, Google, recognizing the growth and the prosperity that EV charging uh, companies are going through, and they wanted to get into that game by putting some information on their app. So that's a great from a charging infrastructure. Now, 2018 also saw a lot of growth in the EV battery market. And a couple of the highlights that I read in this article were, uh, one of them was BMW and Northvolt teamed up to set uh, up an organization to do end-to-end -end EV battery recycling. Now, I talked about this on my last show, which is something a lot of people don't consider. They still think it's a negative for battery electric vehicle ownership of how, what do you do with these battery packs when the life cycle is complete? Well, there's a lot of organizations, and I highlighted a couple on my last show, that are springing up to take care of recycling. And here's a couple of big companies, including BMW, that got into the game. Now, other battery manufacturers are spreading their wings, of course, in 2018 and carrying that forward into 2019. CATL uh, cut a deal with Renault and Nissan to try to ramp up battery production for their products for, uh, for future offerings. So we know that that's coming down the pipe for them. And they also are one of the suppliers and uh, co-building a factory in Germany for BMW and Volkswagen to supply for their electric vehicles as they move forward. So a lot of, a lot of movement by CATL. LG Chem, one of the leaders in the marketplace, of course, raised its 2020 battery production targets 29% uh, from 70 gigawatt hours to 90 gigawatt hours. So quite a quite a jump in its target in production, seeing the upswing in battery electric vehicles and sales projections. SK Innovation announced that it would build an EV factory in the U.S., in the state of Georgia, actually, and at a cost of uh, about $1.67 billion. That's B with a, as in Bob, folks. A lot of money that are being poured into these marketplaces, and that's great for the U.S. economy. Volkswagen, of course, as I've reported before, announced that they were going to uh, sign, put in orders, or that they did sign uh, battery orders totaling $48 billion in future battery orders, as I've talked about in the past about VW spooling up to start kicking out all the ID uh, e, e, uh, battery electric vehicles that they want to, the, the millions that they want to produce over the next uh, dozen or so years, and they need to get the batteries going. So that's great to see that kind of money being thrown around. This is real money. These aren't just not fake stories, fake news headlines, folks. This is real money that's being committed to these projects by a lot of these uh, by, by these organizations that I've mentioned and many more. So it's great to see. Now, one thing that's changing as well within the EV landscape is policies. 
uh, both local and regional and national level policies about electrification and all kinds of countries have rolled out you know bans on ice vehicles uh, for future um, you know different types of uh, regulations and legislation regarding electric vehicles as well um, a couple of that stood out in in my mind uh, uh, here in Quebec uh, of course they're planning out rolling uh, much more EV charging infrastructure and there's very uh, very few EV infrastructure to support the, the mass adoption that's going on in Quebec so it was great to see that but you know you had things going on in California you had things going on in London and Paris uh, even about agreements uh, from a commercial use perspective in Australia Germany all these different countries that's just a, a small read that I've got on this article uh, about what's going on from a policy so I encourage you to keep up and, and, and see what's going on in your area and EV sales, you know, I talked about this on my recap for 2018. They went through the roof. You know, California reached a 10% EV market share in one month. Now, that may not sound like a lot, but California is one of the biggest car markets globally. At least it's the biggest in North America for sure. And 10% is a pretty substantial number uh, to own a market share, uh, even if it's just for a month. So it just shows the rise of electric vehicles and what's going on in California to lead the way in the U.S. and in North America. And of course, Tesla. The Model 3 was the showcase car of the year from a battery electric vehicle perspective, reached new monthly sales records and continued to sell at uh, will today. So those are just a few of the smidgets of stuff that happened in 2018 that really progressed and moved forward the EV industry. And I hope that gives you a, a little bit of uh, positive information and uh, some, some good positive vibes for those people who care about EVs and electrification or what's going on in the world. And I encourage you to, uh, to read and to uh, look out to what's going on in your local areas as well. Just a couple car manufacturers I'll talk about today. Now, Tesla just came out with an announcement a few days ago that they're offering a cheaper or less expensive version of the Model S and Model X. Now, what they've done is they dropped the 75, of course, and they're just going to produce 100 kilowatt hour battery packs. And what they're going to do is go back to software limiting the battery pack to offer a little bit less expensive version from a Model S and an X perspective. So they're also debundling ludicrous upgrades for the performance version to try to uh, lower that price point because a lot of people don't really want ludicrous. I'll tell you folks, battery electric vehicles are fast already. They've got enough torque to get you where you want to go, whether it's a zero to 60 in seven seconds or a zero to 60 in five seconds, it doesn't make a huge difference, folks. And <laughs> that's that's plenty of speed to get you up. I don't I don't really see the need for ludicrous in my mind. It's it's uh, there's not a lot of places that you can use it. Maybe the Autobahn and some other areas where we really need to get going. These things battery electric vehicles by character pass very well they get up to speed very well with all the torque that's there however a lot of people like that want the need for speed so to speak so they're gonna they're gonna buy that but it's good that tesla is giving you the option to add that if you wish so uh, because they've discontinued the 75 kilowatt hour battery pack now with only the 100, so you can buy software limited and they're going to come in a couple different trims for the Model S and the X. Uh, the base price is now 85,000 and these are US dollar figures, folks. Uh, it'll give you a range of about 310 miles and the Model X uh, entry level base price of $88,000 US with a 270 mile range in the base models with that limited software limited battery pack. They don't really say how much the test is not really saying what the capacity is for that software limited but it seems to be slightly higher than what the 75 would have given you based on these range estimates so it's probably somewhere around the 79 to 82 or something like that range so uh, that's all i got to say about tesla it's it's great to see that uh, they're doing uh changing some things to try to make the the affordability that i talked about on the last show a little bit more bearable for people that want to get into the the larger size tesla vehicle of course, the Model 3 is now selling in China, is now going gangbusters in Europe and other areas, so that's great for them. Tesla came out with their financial reporting uh, earlier this week. Another uh, positive uh, profit uh, from a quarter perspective, even though it was a little bit lower than I think they were hoping for, but that's to be expected as they scale up and try to get uh, more lower cost Model 3s out the door. Um, the margins are going to slim down a bit uh, as they scale up. They talked about uh, you know firming up the Model Y in 2020, 2021 timeframe. So again, I, you know until you see a production prototype or something that's pretty close to pre-production, then you can start locking down some times. Tesla's times are, you know, a little bit more varied than most other organizations, maybe uh, from a uh, uh, from an advisement perspective. So take that with a grain of salt. But good to see Tesla doing some uh, some different things. 
Just quick update on the Kia Nero EV. Of course, my 2019 EV of the year. Boy, did I get some flack about that, folks. I got a lot of I got a lot of people uh, responding that agreed with me, but I got a few people that said, you're out of whack. You haven't even driven one of these things. Why are you rewarding this? They're not even hardly selling in the US and all this kind of stuff. And I, I just want to quickly say, folks, look, this is my personal opinion of what I think is really a very all around pick from a choice of a battery electric vehicle the kia nero uh the nero ev offers you know a, a really good size not overly big not overly small i think the kona is just a little bit too small in my perspective same good ba battery pack range stable thermal management there's some videos that just came out about some winter driving and it's really keeping its range uh its efficiencies right right there it's a very very efficient vehicle from that perspective you know that with with the the capacity the performance the, the features on it i think it's just an overall it's got a great package from a from a pricing perspective so that's why i based my decision i didn't necessarily need to go test drive one there's a lot of great videos out there about the the nero ev that people have done uh, alex on autos and others that have done in-depth videos that uh that have teams of people that help them with production i'm a one-man band here folks i do it all so i do what i can when i get an opportunity but certainly i feel that 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 vehicle hits a sweet spot and that's a global view okay so maybe it's going to be constrained in the u.s which i'll talk about in a sec but it's not just the U.S. market, right? This is a when I when I view and I talk about EVs on my show, I'm always looking at a global perspective, and that's kind of what I bring from my channel, not just focused on one marketplace versus another. As an example, the only thing I really kind of stay away from is China because there's just so much going on there, and it's really within most of it's within the Chinese borders. As I as I mentioned on the other show, there are manufacturers that are that are building uh, elements of of their organizations in other countries, so give them the ability to sell product in those countries as well so that's happening as they expand but the, the majority of, of my reporting is, is rest of world outside of china basically so on the nero ev um the uh, kia, kia usa has come out and said that first deliveries are going to start in late february or late this month now and it'll be sold more than just california so a lot of people say ah, oh, it's only going to come out in carb states or zev states it's only going to be in california a couple others it's it's kind of a wash well not really it's going to be uh, starting to sell in a dozen u.s states and those states include california of course connecticut georgia hawaii 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 aloha maryland massachusetts uh, new jersey rhode island um new york oregon texas and washington so um Great to see that they're going to start both a West Coast, East Coast, and offshore as well from a U.S. perspective, um, starting to sell. And there's no confirmed pricing, but they estimate that it's going to be comparable to the Kona around that $36,000, $37,000 entry price USD, but there's no firm pricing. I expect it to be slightly higher than that. Now, these are all going to be built right now. The, the reason for a constraint is because they're only built in one plant, and they're built at uh, Kia's uh, Haswang plant. I probably butchered that name. I believe it's in Korea. So they're only going to be built there right now. They've actually started production in mid-January already, so a couple of weeks ago, and uh, they're starting to uh, probably put vehicles, uh, getting them ready to go down boats and to ship across the ocean uh, into the U.S. or down the West Coast. So um, it's definitely happening, folks. And uh, it's great that Kia has focused on not just California and a couple and only the Zev uh, states. You know, their spokesperson in this article that I'm referencing said, you know, we're way beyond that. Um, Kia has plenty of zero emission credit. Um, and, and they're also globally constrained because of the amount of orders that they're getting in other countries outside the U.S. and Canada. I know that they've opened up orders in Canada for quite some time, especially in Europe, that they're going crazy in Europe and ordering this stuff. And uh, it's very, very strong marketplaces. Uh, countries such as Norway will get a higher priority than countries like the United States, for example, where they've got a larger reservation pool to fill. So it's great to see that Kia is looking to prioritize as well. But uh, if you are interested in this vehicle, get out into your Kia showrooms across the U.S. or wherever you may be in Canada or other parts. Check it out. And uh, I think it'll be a good year for Kia, as I've said all along, as long as they can make, <laughs> if they can produce a good amount and, and all, in, all intense purposes as they want to. So let's just see if they can do that. Now, when I was at Detroit, um, Cadillac unveiled a prototype SUV uh, all-electric vehicle um, 
they didn't have one in there so that's why i didn't really report on it because they made this announcement and then i went to the catalog people and say okay where's the car i'd like to like to see the prototype oh well it's not here we just made an announcement on it i said okay well that's cool uh let me know when you got something more to say um but anyway this article talks that cadillac is going to get into the game you know gm's kind of behind the eight ball it's just unfortunate they keep talking about an electrification strategy but like some of the others you know they've had they've got a good product the bolt's a great car they get rid of the volt unfortunately uh, that's a good uh, step, stepping stone into full electrification, of course. Um, they're talking about other models, but they're a little slow out of the gate here. But at least the Cadillac is saying they're going to get into the game. They've got a new platform that they're coming out with. They call it the BEV3, the BEV3 platform or architecture, and it allows for a broad range of electric cars to be made. The various sizes and body types, including SUVs and crossover utility vehicles as well, in both all-wheel drive, front-wheel drive, and rear-wheel drive configurations, and, and uh, the ability to produce those in left-hand and right-hand drive models as well. So that's there's not a lot more information, but they're saying that they're about three years away from actually starting to get anything out the door from a Cadillac perspective. So, I mean, I hope all the best for GM and for Cadillac. As I've been saying, you know, I'm not siding with any one vendor. I want everybody to, to flourish in this marketplace because choice is good. The more electric vehicles out there, the more choice consumers have, the more the ability that they can buy and get rid of that tailpipe and go into a zero emission vehicle. So I'll keep tracking what's going on with GM and Cadillac from that perspective and report as I find more information. And my last uh, follow-up for my manufacturer today for today's show is Rivian, and I won't spend a lot of time on this because they are getting a ton, ton of press. They've really been the darling of the electric vehicle marketplace for the last couple of months since they've come out of stealth mode, uh, I think at the LA Auto Show or CES, one of the two, I forget which one they premiered at. Um, but, you know, their their SUV and their pickup trucks are just, uh, they're being featured everywhere now. Um, they're, they're really taking a, a positive forward marketing approach to getting their vehicles out there uh, and here's a picture behind me of, of a snapshot of somebody seeing one that left Aspen, Colorado they had it out there for the X Games they had a, some demo displays and they were driving these vehicles around Aspen and now they're heading into the backcountry for presumably winter testing or some testing of these vehicles um, which is great to see now uh, again I've said this on my comments and, and if you know if you're following the show and you're commenting on YouTube you're reading some of this but I'm very positive about Rivian but I want to just put a little bit of caution to the wind they just came out of stealth mode they they had some good funding some good development they're continuing to get funding from venture capitals to keep the company going they've got a game plan they've got two great looking vehicles that are pretty pretty well pre-production prototypes. I mean, I don't see a lot of changes. I think what you're seeing out there now that they're showing is what they're going to be producing. They're, they're really at that point. And that's great. They've got a lot of legwork done. They still have to get into manufacturing these. They still have to get into rolling some serious number of vehicles off the assembly line and into owner's uh, driveways or parking lots or wherever you, you park your car. And that is a pretty big gap still, in my opinion. Uh, they talked about starting to get some initial deliveries out by the latter part of next year in 2020. I really hope they can, but I'm not sure how fast they're going to be able to scale. It might just be a few thousand, and I know that they're getting pre-orders. They're taking pre-orders now for these vehicles, and that's great. So I, I think they're going, you know... They're going after a great market space, as I've talked about before. Ford is dominant. Ford dominates the pickup uh, uh, landscape in North America. It's the F-150 is the number one selling not only truck but vehicle in North America. Believe it or not, in the entire uh, continent here. So there's a huge marketplace for them to go after. But it's not going to happen overnight for them. So that's a big market that they can start to chip away at. And, of course, there's other people that are springing up. Um, one that I was going to talk about, uh, an organization called Atlas, A-T-L-I-S, but I decided really not to because they're really, really just in design. Like they've come out with renderings and there's nothing else for these guys. And they've, they've only got a little bit of money. So, you know, my perspective is until I see something more substantial and they've got some good financial backing to be able to carry them forward, then you can start seeing these guys as real. But when every, people are just coming out with these concepts and renderings and, and making some splash, but there's nothing behind it, you got to read through all that marketing stuff, folks. So Rivian definitely is there. I'm hoping to talk to some of these people. Uh, I don't know if they're going to be at the Canadian 
show coming up here in Toronto this month. But I definitely want to get on board to talk to some of these people and try to see some of this stuff and, and keep following them because they are going to be a mover and shaker in this industry. But just again, use a little uh, caution when when getting excited about them. It's going to take them some time to ramp up to any to scale to make a dent in this marketplace. But good on them and keep looking for their stuff. Well, that's it for the shorter show of the uh, EV Revolution show, episode 29 here. Uh, thank you for tuning in. At the end of this, I'm going to have all my contact information come up on ways that you can reach out to me and follow me and all that good stuff. And uh, of course, my thank you for everybody that's helping me on Patreon and the support there. Um, I will be attending the Canadian International Auto Show coming up in a couple of weeks, so I'm excited about that. But until there, uh, till that time, I'll keep following shows, keep putting some stuff out there. And please don't uh, hesitate to send me uh, comments on YouTube, send me emails, reach out to me on Twitter and all the other mechanisms. And until next time, uh, please, everybody stay safe and we'll see you then. Take care. <laughs>